December 7th, 2017. We are looking at a picture of the serpent, the wise old serpent in the Garden of Eden with Eve, tempting her with the apple. So what is the basis on these stories that we hear time and time again, not just in the Bible, but throughout complete world mythology about serpents and snake-like beings, intelligent, reptilian, snake-like beings uh, throughout history. The, the legends of them are all over the world. Um, and the first one I'm drawn to are, of course, the Nagas. The Nagas are semi-divine demons or de demigods, depending on your take there, with a snake trunk and one or more human heads. The most ancient Indian legends mention that the civilization of the Nagas was powerful at the dawn of mankind. They inhabited under the mythical Mount Meru, which is kind of like Mount Olympus of the gods in, in the Greek legends. In the first book of the Mahabharata, the Nagas are described living on land. Then Brahma had opened wide land and they were descended under it. Having moved into the subterranean world, Patala, Nagas had built to themselves dazzling palaces shining with gold and jewels. The wise dragon Vasuki became the czar, the king of the Nagas and ruled in their subterranean city filled with unprecedented on land treasures so i mean that passage right there just makes me think of smog under the mountain uh in the hobbit in the lord of the rings movies again you can see the european legends very very similar to the indian uh legends about these beings having tremendous treasures and they're very ancient they're more ancient than humans they've been around before humans and they live in a subterranean world that is loaded with riches and they're very wise so they are also perhaps the dragons that we hear of in so many different mythologies so one of them, one of the most famous ones is Shisha, which is a thousand headed dragon that supports the earth and actually serves as a bed for the god Vishnu during his sleep at the ocean and intervals between the creations of the world. So very, very, there, there's just such a rich history with this. And outside of India, Nagas are compared with local snake-like deities, like the Lu in Tibet, the Nadi in Burma, and the Prayanak in Laos, and then dragons in China. They are described in many Vedic texts, epic poems, Puranas, Buddha sutras, and also in some canonical Buddhist texts, for example, the Jakata, Jataka. Their images are presented on reliefs in Angkor Wat in Cambodia and just the legend of Cambodia itself is fascinating because this is a land that was supposedly built by the Nagas their reliefs are on the bridges and temples all over and very very consistent and one of the themes is multi-headed on one body and it's just fascinating to get into why why do we have these legends all over the world you know all of them so so similar although sometimes depending on where you're at in the world they're presented in a more neutral slash positive light and in others completely in more of a negative light and again, that depends on where you are in the world. Um, you know, dragons in Europe and most of the European mythologies will present them in a more negative light, whereas they're more respected in the East. So very, very interesting. And there's also, as we shall see, legends in the Americas as well. 
So old Indian legends have been handed down to us. And basically it talks about that they were very venomous creatures. Their bite and their breath could be considered fatal. They had a hypnotic force to them. Um, in some ways you could see them being the origin of a lot of the vampire legends. Uh, especially, you know, when in relation to, say, Dracula and everything. They were unusually clever, very artful. They were considered as wise men, magicians, and wizards, capable of reviving the dead. And they can change their appearance. So they perfectly possess the art of Maya. They could penetrate through a hard material and then disappear again. So they're great sorcerers. They are the teachers of magic and they've also wrote books. Very, very amazing. They're like semi-immortal beings. And some legends say they're able to fly. And they did intermarry with people again. And they could have offspring with people. And there's time and time again stories of that. So very fascinating subject. Nagas are always shown as serpents in some form, usually as human to the waist, but with the body of a snake instead of legs. Some are shown as humans with the heads of snakes and others have seven snake heads growing from their backs. And some researchers that I've read material of actually think they are the source of the mermaid legends because they are also found in the seas as well. Nagas live under the seas and in the underworld. They are very moody and they are basically seen as being kind of part human and part serpentine. And here again, we're looking at Angkor, or Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia, which is just something that's amazing, you know, to behold. And here we see seven heads, as is typical. And this is more of Angkor Wat. And it's in um, the Nagas are in many, many Buddhist legends as well as Hindu. And this is again a picture of Angkor Wat. Definitely one of the prime mysteries of the world, this beautiful city. And serpentine headdresses. And more reliefs. And Krishna resides on top of a Naga. And Naga is the bed of, of, well, this is actually Vishnu. Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. And so this is Vishnu relaxing in between incarnations. And here we can see there's different types of Nagas. And this is the Nagas, the origin of the Hopi snake clan. So it's not just Asia that we find this. And this talks about the snake dance, the snake dance of the Hopis in uh, Arizona. So participants handle a mass of venomous and non-venomous snakes. Some even put in their necks and bodies into their mouths. Unlike serpent worship, the snake dance is a plea for agricultural fertility and for rain in a beautiful but harsh desert landscape. However, many spectators would be surprised to learn that this bizarre rite came from India, the traditional land of snake charmers. The ancient Hopi myth describes a migration from the flooded third world to the fourth world. The ancestral Hopi escaped on reed rafts and made their way to the mouth of the Colorado River up which they traveled to seek their final destination upon the Colorado Plateau. 
A stepping stone in the monumental journey may have been the remote South Pacific island of Fiji. Here the fertility and the youth initiation ceremony called Baki took place. Its name is similar to the Hopi term Paki, which means entered or start being initiated. Hopi language does not recognize the B sound. The kiva, or subterranean prayer chamber used during the snake dance, is called a pocket. A naga, and this is the Hopi. So this is Southwest United States, Hopi Indians, you know, Native American Indians, with the same word as we have out of the Hindu tradition in India, you know, half a world away. So a naga, or nanaga, were one of the many walled sites where the Fiji boys entered manhood. Explorer David Hatcher Childress writes that one of the ancient races of Southeast Asia is the Nagas, which is a seafaring race of people who trace their serpent boats, similar to the dragon ships of the Vikings. Originating in India, the Nagas established religious centers throughout the country, including the kingdom of Kashi on the Ganges, Kashmir to the north, and Nagpur in central India. The Nagas also inhabited the great metropolitan centers of Mohenjo-Daro, which is a, a fascinating site, and Harappa in the Indus River Valley. They founded the port city on the Arabian Sea and exchanged goods globally using a universal currency of cowries. As masters of arcane wisdom, the Nagas bequeathed to Mesoamerica the concept of Nagual, which is too complex to explain here in detail, but it's it's delineated in books by Carlos Castaneda and is tutelage with the Yaqui sorcerer Don Juan Matas. The Nagas may also have been snake people whom the Hopi cultural hero Tio met on his epic voyage across the ocean. In the underworld, he enters a room where people wear snake skins. He is initiated into strange ceremonies in which he learns rain prayers. After the young man is given a pair of maidens who sing to help him grow corn, he carries them home to the earth's surface. The snake woman becomes his wife, while the other becomes the bride of the flute youth. Finally, his wife gives birth to reptiles, which causes Tio to leave his family and migrate to another country. Like Homer's Odyssey, the story involves a subterranean visit. Paradoxically, the Hopi conceptualize this as a realm of both water and stars. Na ni yos, well, I'm, I'm going to butcher that. <laughs> Na ni uh, sohu is the chasing star Kachina, who wears a plain style eagle feather headdress and a large four pointed star painted on his mask. Kachinas are spirits in the form of any object, creature, or phenomenon. Nanga means to pursue, and Soho means star. Related to Naga, the Hopi word Nagat, which means medicine root with magical healing properties. A root is both chthonic and also morphologically snake-like. The term Nakwa refers to headdress feathers worn during a sacred ceremony. The plumage suggests the feathered serpent. Another related word Nakvuat means ear, and Nakwa means ear pendant, frequently made of abalone. So it's really amazing. You know, there's been contact all over the world, like we're not taught that there's contact. You know, truly, there were global civilizations way before ours, and we went into some sort of dark age for a very, very long time. Here's another picture of the Nagas. And so there's legends that state that they lived on what we would term nowadays as Mu before it sank. And when Mu did sink, they escaped and they basically founded civilizations in North and South America as well as in Asia. And again, we can see another map of Mu and a direct line over to, to Southeast Asia. And that's part of the escape route. So they are actually, there is um, an actual tribe that 
uh, lives in India and supposedly come out of the blood, of mixed blood, of humans with Nagas. And this tribe is known as the Nagas. And they trace their origins and their oral legends go back to the leaving of Mu and coming and inhabiting uh, the lands of Cambodia. And these two gentlemen are some of the Nagas that inhabit all of Southeast Asia and, and also into uh, India, into the eastern, northeastern part of India itself. And the Nagas inhabit four states in India and the western parts of Myanmar. And they live between Brahmaputra and the Chindwin River. And it gives specific longitudes and latitudes. They have no written history, but they have their oral traditions. Which basically says, you know, that as I was saying, they came from Mu and made their way to where they currently reside. And they do say that they are the people of the snake. So this gets into, this is an article on Gaia, reptilian aliens, the master shapeshifters. No other alien species strikes as much fear in the human psyche as the reptilian. These beings, snake-like in appearance and malevolent by nature, are the stuff of nightmares. Is it possible that reptilian humanoids are the source of devils and demonic entities who have tormented humanity since early history? Well, that seems to be a consensus thought among a lot of the ancient alien scholars. Chinese mythology, there's a special reverence for reptilian creatures. Dragon kings symbolize the power of the four elemental corners, shape-shifting into humans as well. Pulled by celestial dragons in their heavenly chariots. Islamic mythology, the jinn are creatures of smokeless fire who sometimes appear as snake-like beings. The jinn were created by God and exist under the same rules as mankind. Sumerian, some researchers believe that extraterrestrial entities have influenced humans since the beginning of human history, creating cultural practices around their likeness. Zechariah Sitchin believed the Anunnaki of Sumerian mythology was an ancient ET race controlling humans and using them as slaves to do their be their bidding biblical there are also claims that the snake from genesis was in fact a reptilian being who convinced eve to break her oath to god by tasting the forbidden fruit of knowledge could these myths be interpretations of reptilian humanoids suited for the time place and circumstance around the ancient mo moment of contact so Abductees report a variety of skin colors ranging from brown to green, red, sometimes white. These colors and the presence of wings are said to signify rank among the reptilians, with the white-skinned beings being viewed as the elite class, standing anywhere from 6 to 8 feet tall. And then if you're talking about the Draco, 14 feet tall. So very interesting stuff. And what are their intentions? Of course, David Icke, who is a popular researcher, um, he's accused presidents, kings, and queens of being shape-shifting aliens or hybrids intent upon controlling the resources on planet Earth for their own benefit. Although the reptilian is often approached as a physical creature, some claim that these beings exist outside of our dimension. This would make their shape-shifting an immaterial manipulation of human consciousness. Reptilian creatures seem to be warlike beings bent on conquest and control. Positive reptilians are not the norm, and many abductions involve forcible acts upon the abductees. Some of these intrusions are sexual in nature, leading researchers to the conclusion that a hybridization between human and reptile may be in progress. Abductees are reported counting, encountering strange amphibian-like beings while aboard reptilian ships. But perhaps the truth of their intervention dates back even farther in, than recent encounters. Researchers hypothesize that human beings may have been genetically altered by these entities for thousands of years, torn from a peaceful evolutionary path by otherworldly forces and subsequently enslaved. 
The darkest rumors go beyond genetic manipulation. Some believe that reptilians are farming humans as cattle to satiate their apparent taste for earthling flesh. So, I'm sure most of us have heard these things, but it could be fresh to some of you out there. Have you ever heard of Interview with Lacerda? This is something that was really was pretty interesting. Um, and it happened way back in 1999, December 1999, that supposedly Lacerda, who is what I would call more likely a Naga, and from what I've done researching wise, I don't necessarily think that the Nagas and the reptilians are exactly the same thing. And um, Lacerda basically talks about that. So she is supposedly, uh, I would say she's a Naga. She is a reptilian humanoid living inside the earth. And in fact, she goes on in the interview to say that her people have been here for millions and millions of years and they are in fact the original inhabitants and she goes on to say that humanity is a creation of otherworldly beings and was placed here and basically we are kind of the invaders we are the aliens that what we take as the nagas are actually the original natives of this planet and in the interview he starts with first of all who are you and what are you are you an extraterrestrial species or can your origin be found on this planet she says as you can see with your own eyes I'm not a human being like you and to be honest I'm not a real mammal despite my partly mammal like body features which are a result of evolution I'm a, reptile, a female reptile being belonging to a very old reptilian race. We are the native Terrans, and we've lived on the planet since millions of years. We are mentioned in your re religious writings like your Christian Bible, and many of the ancient human tribes were aware of our presence and worshipped us as gods. For example, the Egyptians and the Inca, many of the old tribes. Your Christian religion has misunderstood our role in your creation, so we are mentioned as evil spirits in your writings, or the evil serpent in your writings. This is wrong. Your race was genetically engineered by aliens, and we were just the more or less passive visitors of this accelerated evolution process. You must know some of your scientists have already supposed this, and that your species had evolved in a naturally completely impossible speed within just two to three million years so she's saying that we were a later creature that came about on a particular evolutionary path but if we were not tampered with we would not be at the level that we're at now even close we would still be very very primitive so and she is saying that the speed at which we evolved is absolutely impossible because evolution is a very slow process so our creation human creation was artificial and done by genetic engineering but not by us but by an alien species that's not of this planet if you ask me if i'm an extraterrestrial i must answer no we are native terrans we had and have some colonies in the solar system, but we originate on this planet. It's our planet and not yours. It was never yours. And then she gives her her name. And she talks about measuring time and all. And says that she's about 28 years old. And then she gets into some of their society and I will have all the links on this so you can read it in more detail but basically she gets into the fact that they were here first there was intervention on the planet and they were forced to kind of go into the earth to survive and you know they are kind of parts they're, they're part of the wars that have been going on between different groups and um, 
they are really not the reptilians. So even though they are reptilian, they are not the reptilians that are the negative ET reptilians that we hear about. They're a different group. So it's very, very interesting read, and I hope you guys will take a chance to, to get into it a little bit more. Um, it's one of those ones that you might take with a grain of salt, because we, we do not know if this is real or not, but then how do we know if anything is real or not, really? So I hope you guys found this interesting. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, and please share with as many people as possible. Let's wake people up. And if you haven't subscribed yet, then do hit subscribe and grow the, join the growing Evolutionary Energy Arts family. We so appreciate you. And thank you for coming by and sharing. And definitely go ahead, please leave comments below. I'd love to hear all your take on this. Um, I feel like we're able to finally piece together a lot of things to get a picture of what's going on. And actually, reality is probably far more interesting and wild and crazy than we ever probably thought. Thank you all for stopping by Evolutionary Energy Arts once again. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.